Well, and, and as, as you know, John, there are a lot of laws that are on the books that say you cannot wear a mask during the commission of a, of a particular offense. Uh, what we're looking for, is this ordinance too broad? Is it touching way too many areas uh, outside of where the immediate convention is occurring, where the immediate protesting is anticipated? Are we going too far out where it will impact those of us that live in these areas and uh, have no intention of participating perhaps in the convention? So we're looking at the constitutional attack on is it too broad? We understand what we're trying to avoid. But once you get outside of this immediate area, do you really need to get into the into those communities that are contiguous uh, to the downtown? Yes, yeah, thank you, Julie. Yeah. Um, we're not going to we're not going to accommodate that right this second. But Professor, uh, you and then Mickey, I'd say you got your mic at the ready. Thank you. I'll just say two quick things. I think the hypo you identified is a reasonableness question primarily. I think the as the reasonableness of the restriction wanes, the government interest rate wanes with it. And so, and the opportunity for um, alternative communication sort of follows suit. So I think it's, that is the, a much better example of a potentially unconstitutional application of the mask provision, I think, for sure, the hypo you gave. I also do want, I caused trouble with the hypo before, and let me just say this. I tell my students all the time, and it's true, um, all branches of government are constitutional actors and constitutional interpreters. And from my point of view, um, I gave an example of a burqa. I think that's an example of a potential constitutional issue that is resolved in the enforcement pro process as much as it's involved in the legislation process. And I don't envision a significant amount of law enforcement focusing on people wearing religious symbols as maps under this provision. And that is part of their both constitutional duty, responsibility, prerogative, and, um, and the way that I think law enforcement generally operates. So I think it's not a lack of faith on my part that I cite that. It's an example that everybody is in this together on some level when it comes to the constitutional interplay um, with these issues. Mickey. Mickey? Another way of looking at the reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions is that whatever the statute is, it doesn't restrict any more speech than is necessary to achieve that governmental interest. So I think in this case, you know, given where they're located, what governmental interests are, you know, is being served by possibly arresting four people having lunch together wearing masks. And I, again, it's very fact specific. So it's just people out there are going to have to exercise common sense on both sides of the issue. And if people do that, the likelihood of unnecessary litigation and lawsuits is decreased. The problem is, without preparation, without discussion, without training, in the heat of the moment, things happen. Uh, and um, that's where the problem lies. Thank you. Ellen, um, the, the media reported this week um, the sort of the interesting twist about uh, the types of things you can bring into the clean zone and into the public viewing area. Um, specifically, you know, you, you can't bring chains, uh, you know, uh, you can't bring chains in, uh, knives, two by, pointed two by fours, you can't bring toy guns or, or water, water pistols and that sort of thing. But then the, as the reporters uh, indicated, it, and I was sort of embarrassed because I didn't even catch it, but that you can't, you can't bring all these things because they might be used as weapons, but the, but you can bring licensed firearms. Um, <laughs> So, so, okay, there you go, law student. Explain that one. <laughs> I told Professor Gorelli that I would defer to him on these issues. <laughs> we, we, were, we were joking about it, but, um, you know, you can't bring a super soaker, but then, you know, how are you going to defend the handgun bullets that are coming at you? You know, the tripods aren't there, but, um... <laughs> so, I mean, I, I understand the... Um, I think that, um, you know, it's a, it's a state statute and how that really matches up with this ordinance will be um, interesting because the government interest here really is public safety. And when you do have a lot of people assembled where there's a lot of passion and emotions are high, I think the challenge is going to be in the enforcement. And yeah, I think that um, being able to have a concealed weapon is one thing, but preventing people from using it is going to be the utmost 
responsibility of the law enforcement. Thank, thank you all. Jim, give us a little, a little rendition on how, you know, because originally I think uh, I read in the paper that, that originally it prohibited handguns or uh, that sort of thing, but then you all realized the state statute was there. The state statute is there and it's very clear uh, what it says. And so, you know, whether that was it or really draft or not, tell me what it says. Excuse me. I mean, it basically preempts local governments from regulating um, firearms and other things. And it has very severe penalties for violating that. And so, you know, we can look into some alternatives, but we may want to call Governor Scott on that or the legislature. <laughs> I, I think what, what Jim is saying, so that all of you know, for in our office, we had a very strict policy in our office that said you could not carry firearms and bring them in. Pursuant to the law that exists now, that's no longer true. I could have 220 employees that come in there if they have a carry concealed firearm and bring a weapon in. In Tallahassee this year, they just realized this year what law they passed. I just want, I, I want you to understand that people tried to come into Tallahassee this year with their guns, with their carry concealed weapon, everybody goes, oh my gosh, what? And so they put in panic buttons for the legislative members. So, it, it, and I just want you to understand, it's, it's a very serious issue, and it's going to be, and, and I'm, I certainly defer constitutionally to everyone on this side of me, to the right, uh, but it's going to be interesting to see the United States Supreme Court, if they ever were to see something such as this, where you say you can't bring in a water pistol, but you could bring in the concealed firearm that none of the other protesters may know you have in your possession. So I think it's going to be a very interesting question, and I certainly think that our, our, uh, we are challenged on that particular area from a public safety issue, and, and I, I think that it's something that we should uh, work on long term in, in terms of uh, state law. Well, and then you get the added twist that people have been asking me about the last couple of days is how does stand your ground play uh, in, this, in, this, in this whole discussion? That, that, that's not going to be one we're going to tackle tonight. We don't have, en we don't have enough time. Um, let, me throw us, uh, let me throw us into another little hypothetical and then I'm going to start have y'all been gathering up questions? Uh, got some questions for us from the audience? Okay, I'm gonna do one more sort of standardized thing and then we'll, we'll go over to your questions. Um, all right, here's the hypothetical. Anarchy International, uh, I don't know if they exist, but Anarchy International contacts the city, Jim, uh, contacts the city on August 20th, about a week before the convention's about to begin. And they advise the city that they have a group of about 2,000 demonstrators and they plan on holding a protest rally on the Monday of the RNC at Curtis Hickson Park, followed by a parade up Kennedy Boulevard at 5 p.m. Monday evening. Tampa Police Department is notified by, by the Parks Department because the Parks Department is the ones who's doing these permit applications. Tampa Police Department detectives take a look at An Anarchy International's website and sees that it the website expressly advocates the violent overthrow of the government. It shows pictures of them at the 2008 DNC convention in Denver with carrying baseball bats. And specifically, well, never mind. All right, um, I've already gone too far. Okay, so, so Jim, um, uh, I gave you a little preview on that, on that um, uh, scenario. In your opinion, would Anarchy International need a permit for their rally and or their parade? And is one week advance notice to the city uh, enough or is it too late for them to apply for that permit under the proposed ordinance? Well, again, we have a proposed ordinance here that's not adopted by city council, so we're speaking. That's a given. We'll solely, give in, that. solely in hypotheticals here, but, but under the way that we're thinking about it, yes, they would need to get a permit because they would have a group large enough to require a permit, um, and we will react with less than two, I mean, we'll, we'll react, the ordinance would provide that we would respond to even people that, that apply less than 14 days before the event, because we're trying to be accommodating as possible to all the groups that allow people to you know, properly exercise their First Amendment rights. How about, how about this parade, parade route down Kennedy Boulevard 5 p.m. on Monday? of the event. That's, that's their idea. That's what they think they want to do. Well, what we're working on right now is, is identifying uh, an official parade route 
that we hope we would be able to direct the parades to. Um, because otherwise, we've got to take consideration transportation, traffic flow in and out of downtown, public safety, and other considerations. So we'll try to the best we can direct people to the official parade route. Professor, you talked about reasonable alternatives as a key part of this uh, entire analysis. Um, under this scenario, you know, if the city denies uh, that Kennedy Boulevard protest, which Mickey, by the way, is our main street right through the middle of downtown, um, what sort of reasonable alternatives do you think the city is under obligation to, to offer? Well, I'm no geographer, and I'm certainly not a leader in the room on Tampa geography either, being a bit of a transplant myself. I mean, I, I don't think they have a particular First Amendment right as a constitutional matter to use a particular street, even if that street is more prominent than others. Um, I do think there is going to be some conversation about accommodating a similar venue, so a, a public street as opposed to an alley or some sort of purely residential area. Um, but I think reasonableness there is relatively easy to accommodate. I think removing a parade is certainly within the context of time, place, and manner, the, con the concept of time, place, and manner restrictions. Um, the government purpose is pretty clear, and there's lots of First Amendment precedent about relocating folks. Okay. Um, we do have some city folks in, in the audience, uh, including my good friend Santiago. And Santiago saw this permit application, he immediately uh, contacted uh, my other good friend Kirby back there and, and he said, wait a second, he said, take a look at this website. These are dangerous people. We can't grant them a permit. Uh, professor, um, what's your thoughts on that? that gets Just wrong. kidding, Santiago. I know you wouldn't do that. And I don't subscribe to any of the proper names used in the hypo, just for the record. But, um, I think that's a much more difficult First Amendment question. I think it's very hard to prohibit or to um, deny a permit on the basis of sentiments expressed on a website, even if they're violent, because of the various doctrines surrounding the First Amendment. So that is a content restriction, I think it would be, um, which would require what we call strict scrutiny in the business. I mean, if you know what that is, you need a compelling government interest, and you need a means that is narrowly tailored to achieve that interest. Um, it is a compelling government interest, I think it's fair to say, to protect people from violence, but the way the First Amendment doctrine has worked is that a prohibition would not be narrowly tailored, and the doctrine that that would shift to primarily would be the imminent harm doctrine, the incitement doctrine, which is very difficult to establish without the immediate threat of imminent harm. And the precedent that I'm familiar with, and I think it's fair to say, the large body of precedent in the, in the incitement area would not include the projection of violent acts by, um, by a group that advocates it as a general matter in another forum like a website. Jim? John, I would just, just like to read one section of the proposed ordinance uh, that might answer that question. In determining whether to grant or deny an application for a public gathering permit, it would also be applicable to a parade permit, the department director shall not consider the content of the beliefs expressed or anticipated to be expressed during the assembly, the identi identity or associational relationships of the applicant, any assumptions or predictions as to the amount of hostility which may be aroused in the public by the by the content of the speech or message conveyed at the event, nor may the department director favor non-First Amendment activities over First Amendment activities. We have thought about some of those things. Okay, you've thought about, definitely thought about some of those.